This happened a couple of years ago when I was around 13 to 14 years old. I would go to Nerf Wars with my friends during the weekends with a semi-auto rifle and one of those revolver-looking pistols as a sidearm. On one of those occasions, I brought my girlfriend to the Nerf War with me. For some context, my girlfriend's my neighbor. She lives in the same area I do, and we've known each other for some time, since around preschool, I think. As you do for a Nerf War, you pack up spare darts, spare mags, etc. So the Nerf War ended and we had a great time as usual, and we went our separate ways. As my girlfriend and I start walking back home, my paranoia kind of kicks in, and I have a feeling that someone is following us. I glanced back slightly, and there was a guy in full black. At first I thought it was just one of my friends awkwardly following us, but then I remembered that none of them were wearing full plain black that day. So I turn back to my girlfriend and tell her that I think we're being followed. She glances back slightly and sees the same guy. She starts panicking, so I tell her to calm down. It's probably just some guy going to the subway as well. So we get on the train, hoping that the man would stop following us. As I'm making sure my rifle isn't bothering anyone, I didn't have space to store my Nerf rifle even when it was taken apart, so I just had it slung around my waist. I feel my girlfriend's grip on my hand tighten. Then she whispers, telling me that the man was on the train as well and was staring at us. At this point, I'd had enough of this guy's crap. I was tired and the last thing I needed was some dude stalking my girlfriend and I. Luckily, our stop was two stations away. So when we got there, we bounced right out of that car. I looked back and the man was indeed behind us. We get up to the streets hoping that there would be at least someone or some sort of camera that would be able to see my girlfriend and I. But the streets were basically empty, with only a couple of people going back home. My girlfriend was trembling beside me, scared as all hell. I told her my plan, and with some hesitancy, she agreed to it. I stopped moving to take a drink of water, my girlfriend shifting her hand toward my leg so it wouldn't be as obvious. It was dark at the time. I felt her hand being ripped away from my leg, and I heard her terrified screams. I decided to grab the closest weapon I had on me, the stock of my Nerf rifle. The stocks attached to Nerf guns with two clips latching onto them, so it wouldn't take long to pull it on or off. My stock was pretty big. It wasn't metal, but it was a solid piece of plastic that could do some damage to someone's face. I whacked the guy around the face, grabbed my girlfriend's hand, and got out of there. We waved down the closest taxi, got on and sighed, happy that we weren't being followed by some guy. I don't talk about this incident much, but I just wanted to share it and get it off my chest. Because of that incident, I stopped playing Nerf for a while. My Nerf's been stored in my Nerf armory for a couple of years, untouched. Every time I think of it, this incident comes to mind. I'm really just telling this story as a way to vent because I'm in a situation where I really just feel stuck. I've tried just about everything, so I guess I'm just gonna start from the beginning. This story is two years in the making, so I'll try to be as thorough as possible. In 2019, I graduated with my master's degree and moved to a relatively rural area for my PhD. Thinking we'd make an investment, my dad and I purchased a house. The intent was to rent it out once I completed my PhD. This house was only a block away from a dive bar where my dad was able to make some pretty good friends. He introduced me to everyone and everyone let me know that I would be so happy in my new house because my next door neighbor was the absolute nicest guy you could ever meet. So we met the neighbor and he did seem nice enough. He suggested that we exchange numbers, just in case I ever needed anything, and I thought that was a good idea. 
what's the worst that could happen? A few days later, my dad left to go back to his home in another state, and I was left to my own devices. Literally the day after he left, it started. My neighbor texted me while I was away and let me know that he left a gift for me on my front porch. In this text exchange, he started using pet names like Sweetie and Cutie. I went home and he had left a hand-painted feeding dish for my cats in my mailbox. At this point, I wasn't that alarmed. He was just being nice, I thought. The next day, he sent me more texts with pet names and I took the opportunity to make sure he knew that I was not interested in anything romantic. He replied back with a rambling text about how all a person ever needs is friends and he would just like to be friends with me. After that, he would send me texts frequently. Everything from inviting me fishing to telling me that he left more gifts on my porch. I would often not reply or I would tell him that I was busy. I didn't want to be rude, but I also had no interest in any sort of relationship with him other than being neighborly. One night, I got a text from the manager of the bar down the street, letting me know that if my neighbor knocked on my door, I shouldn't answer. She then told me that my neighbor had walked down to the bar with a hatchet and told the bartender he was hearing voices that got louder as he got closer to the bar. He threatened to kill someone with the hatchet if the voices didn't stop. They called the police and the police took the hatchet from him but made no arrest. The manager of the bar picked me up and I spent the night at her house. She told me that the police said my neighbor was heavy into meth. After that, I tried to keep my distance even more, but things got weirder. One day I went out to my car and I found a dead squirrel in my driveway. The squirrel had very clearly been run over and moved to right in front of my driver's side door. I just stepped over it, got in my car and left. When I returned home, the squirrel was gone. Shortly after, I received a text from my neighbor that said, someone or something put a dead squirrel in your driveway. Don't worry, I moved it for you. I felt like this was a weird way to word this and I suspect he's the one who put the squirrel in the driveway. Another time, I walked out of my house to see that he had placed an unspent shotgun shell on the bricks in front of his yard. He came out and told me that it was to serve as a warning for anyone walking between our houses. For the next couple of months, I did my best to avoid him. He would text me inviting me over and I would come up with an excuse or just ignore him completely. I wanted to remain cordial since he was my neighbor but it was getting very annoying and I was uncomfortable. He would text me as soon as I got home, telling me that he was watching me come and go from my house. On Halloween, he handcrafted a large casket and wrote, here lies the last son of a bitch who played mind games, November, 2012. I mean, what the hell, right? All this time, he's still sending me texts. Eventually, I got really fed up and I just stopped responding completely. Less than two weeks after I stopped responding, he threw a 50 pound flower pot at my front door. You know, those big concrete planters? Yeah, one of those. I called the police who advised me to get a stalking no contact order. A few days later, I was watching TV when a notification popped up that my neighbor was trying to cast a video to my screen. I declined it, twice. I filed another report with the police. During this time, I started the process of getting a stalking no contact order. I saw three different victim advocates who all told me different things. I went out of town for a conference and during that time, someone had attempted to break into my home. I had an ADT security system, so while they didn't succeed, I was aware of the attempt. After the conference, I came home to the entire world shutting down because of the pandemic. I was trapped in my home 24 seven with my stalker neighbor next door. Luckily, court proceedings for protection orders didn't stop. Right before court, he sent me a text telling me that he was sorry for what he'd done, that he could tell when he saw me outside that he made me uncomfortable. Then he went on to tell me that he could tell my hair had gotten longer and I looked beautiful. I went to court and provided all of the evidence I had. 
the timeline of everything that had ever happened. The texts he'd sent me asking if I wanted a massage. The texts I sent him telling him that the way he was speaking to me was inappropriate. The texts saying he knew he made me uncomfortable. I told the judge that I suspected he had attempted to break into my house while I was out of town. The kicker is, he didn't deny any of it. Actually, he told the judge that he took full accountability for everything. He said he was in recovery and was trying to turn over a new leaf. He didn't oppose to the protection order at all. So, in March of 2020, I actually received the stalking no contact order. Everything was pretty quiet for a while. I mean, he did some weird things, but that's because he's a weird guy. It wasn't anything that made me fear for my safety. That is, until he started using again. At this time, we found an unspent shotgun casing in my flower bed. It was consistent with the one he had previously used to send a warning. This occurred a couple of months after I started dating my boyfriend, and I suspect it was a warning to him. After this, and for a variety of reasons, my boyfriend moved in with me. He moved in pretty quickly, but everything turned out fine. We're still together and happy as can be in our relationship. New Year's 2021, I was awoken to yelling. I turned on my security cameras and I got footage of him sticking his head out his window, screaming obscenities at my bedroom window for seven full minutes. It doesn't sound like a long time, but when your stalker is screaming threats and obscenities, seven minutes is a lifetime. He called me a harlot. He said, happy effing new year. He said he was going to blow up his house with his gas line. I called the police who responded. They told me that because he never said my name, they can't prove it was a violation of the protection order. The officer said, and I quote, there's nothing illegal about yelling in your own house. They left without even speaking to him. All I could do at this point was do my best to avoid him. I parked on the street because my driveway is pretty close to his front porch. I got used to living with my curtains drawn. I always made sure my cameras were charged, all five of them. Yes, because of him, I spent over a thousand dollars on cameras. Every inch of my yard is covered. Since then, he's been seen by me and by other neighbors talking to people who aren't even there, going outside and screaming nonsense, things like, I have Cheerios on my necklace and other things. I'm not even joking. This basically brings me to last week. In the morning, I was getting ready for the day when I heard screaming. Someone is gonna die over this sweatshirt. I turned on the cameras. I got footage of him walking around the alley behind my house, screaming. Are you effing proud? How about I get my shotgun? I'll get everyone all fired up. I called the police. Once again, they didn't charge him with a violation of the protection order. Instead, they gave him an ordinance violation for disturbing the peace. The police told me that it seemed like he's off his meds again, and that was that. They left. Last night, I was awoken to hammering outside my window at 1 a.m. He was cutting down his privacy fence, horizontally. I called the police for a noise complaint and they just told him to stop. As I write this, he is outside, continuing to horizontally cut down his privacy fence. That means the privacy fence only stands about three feet tall now. This was the one thing that made me feel relatively safe about hanging out in my own backyard, and now that's gone. All of this to say, I'm freaking tired. I just want to live in a house where I can be sure that my neighbor won't try to kill me, where I can feel confident that he's not going to try to break in. My boyfriend and I are trying to buy a house and to move, but it's difficult. I'm a PhD student, so I don't make very much money. Renting won't work because I have four cats. Plus my partner's cat and dog, although we have a place secured for them if necessary. And finding a place to rent with so many animals is difficult, if not impossible. I refuse to rehome them. So maybe it's partially my fault that I'm stuck in this situation. My dad has agreed to co-sign on another mortgage and I've gotten a second job. We should be able to save up enough money within a few months, but until then, I'm stuck. I just don't know what else to do. I'm tired, I'm angry, so I figured I would tell this story to vent. This isn't even everything that happened. 
It's just something to give you an idea of what's been going on. I'm just so exhausted. First off, I just want to say that this has been ongoing for years. We were literally 13 to 14 years old when stuff started going down. I'm 18 now and I have a lot more common sense, or I would like to think so. So please try and look at this from a 13 year old's perspective and try not to judge our actions too harshly. Also, this gives more context to the adults in our lives not believing us. I have ridden horses all my life, but have never kept them close to home. When the opportunity came to keep them five minutes down the road from my house and with my best friend's ponies, I was over the moon. Little did I know what was to take place over the following years. I will start this with a backstory. The horse I owned at the time came from a rescue that I volunteered at for five years. I was sitting down one day drinking a cup of tea with the owner of the rescue center, as we usually did after a hard day of mucking out fields and dragging barrels of hay to the 40 horses and donkeys that lived there, when she told me about a farm that was just down the road from my house in a little village that we'll call Trophy. She said that her father had built that farm and that he'd be turning in his grave if he found out who owns it now. Immediately, I was intrigued, so I pushed for more info. She told me that the man who owns it now is Elliot, who is a pig farmer. He murdered his brother-in-law, who was asking him to pay back 150000 in debt. Apparently, he ground him up in a meat grinder and fed him to the pigs. He then moved those pigs two to three hours away for long enough so that when the police eventually tracked them down, any DNA would have been long out of their system. He was actually charged for murder, but ended up being acquitted by the judge due to lack of evidence. What's ironic is that he moved those pigs without a moving permit, which is illegal and suspicious as hell because moving permits are not that hard to get a hold of. So in the end, he got punished for the illegal transport of livestock and not for murder. She told me that although he was eventually found not guilty, Everyone in the village knew that he did it. Now that we've got that out of the way, we'll go back to the farm that I would be keeping my horses at. I had known the owners for a while, as I used to ride one of Annie's horses, my best friend that I mentioned earlier. Nothing particularly scary happened while I was riding for her, except once. We had decided to ride down a different trail that day, one that went past an unfamiliar farm. We didn't know who owned it and we weren't sure if they were friendly, so we proceeded with caution. All seemed fine as we were riding through the fields until the path came to a stop. There were gates and guard dogs in the way. We assumed we must have taken a wrong turn, so instead of passing through the gates, we decided to carry on through the fields and around the outskirts of the farm. Unknowingly, we were now trespassing. The horses started to feel extremely uneasy beneath us. Mine would stop and shoot forward. Annie's started backing up into the brook that ran alongside us. Annie was hanging off hers, deciding whether to throw herself off before they both ended up in the ditch when I looked toward the farm. A man was stood completely still staring at us. I honestly thought he was a scarecrow at first and I had no idea how long he'd been there. He disappeared after about 30 seconds of making eye contact with me. For some reason, it made the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. There was something so unsettling about him. A few minutes later, we finally got the horses under control. That's when we heard gunshots behind us. Guns are illegal in my country. Only licensed owners can have them. The only reasonable explanation was that somebody was scaring birds off their crops or shooting bunnies and they hadn't seen us coming. We went into a flat out gallop. We were terrified because if they really didn't know we were there, we could have been caught by a stray bullet. 
All the while, we were looking back to see if any birds flew to confirm our theory. They never did. That shot was meant for us, to warn us to stay away. Later that night, we looked back at the map to see where our wrong turn had been. The gates were where the trail carries on, but who in their right mind would go past a bunch of snarling guard dogs? At any point, that man could have redirected us. Shooting toward us was pretty psychopathic. We didn't tell anyone that day, as we thought we would get in trouble for trespassing. But that's only where the problems began. When I brought Eric to the farm, things calmed down. There were odd scenarios that played out. Sheep were stolen, our ponies were let out, and a white pickup truck would be seen prowling the area often. But again, nothing too serious. That was until October of that year, when we would end up riding in the dark as the days were shorter in the winter. This particular evening, we were just goofing around and laughing, like 14-year-olds do, when we heard an owl hooting. It was coming from one of the fields that the scary farmer owned. I began imitating it, joking around, and not really expecting a reply, but it did reply. I found this hilarious and Annie began joining in. This carried on for about five minutes, which in hindsight was definitely a red flag. Any owl would have stopped replying within the first two or three calls, realizing that it wasn't speaking to one of its own. This one always replied and sounded louder every few calls. The longer this went on, the less owl-like this thing sounded. There was a moment where the noise almost sounded strangled. And that was when Annie turned to me and said, that is not an owl. We realized that we had just led whoever was in that field right to us. They could now pinpoint exactly where we were. We turned our flashlights off and ducked, trying to be quiet, which is difficult when you have a 1200 pound animal squishing through the mud underneath you. We decided screw it and we galloped the rest of the field back to the farm. What we didn't realize was that the weight of the horses had left deep hoof marks in the soil leading straight back to us. We were freaking out as we got back but the adrenaline began to wear off and we ended up laughing about it while untacking the horses. We were about to lead them to the field when we heard the crunch of broken glass being stepped on from one of the old greenhouses opposite the stables. It was pitch black except for the dull light coming from behind us, so we couldn't see anything. Immediately, we turned all the lights off, picked up a pocket knife that we used to cut hay bags open with, and hid behind the stable door. We waited for 10 minutes with no phone signal to call the police, but didn't hear a thing, scared to even breathe in case it made too loud of a sound. I decided to be brave and make a dash for the horses who were tied up outside, thinking that if I could jump onto one, I could get out of there quicker than whoever I might see. My eyes had adjusted to the darkness, so I could kind of see into the greenhouse. I shouted back to Annie, there's no one here, we're just being paranoid. Again, we laughed it off, trying to shake the terror that we had just experienced. It was only the next day that it became very, very real. The next morning was hot. The ground had baked and preserved the hoof prints we left from the previous night. However, there was something else in between them. Massive boot prints leading from the field we had heard the owl in all the way back to our farm. That was where the nickname Farmer Bigfoot came about. We told our parents, but they decided that we were just making drama out of paranoia and didn't believe us, and that was that. These boot prints started appearing a lot. We would skate on the ice where the fields flooded over in the winter. We noticed the prints a few times, stopping on the edge of the field where we would skate and then continuing in the opposite direction. We didn't ever see anyone watching us though. I lost Annie's phone in the fields one night. We went looking for them in the dark. The next morning, footprints, Farmer Bigfoot footprints. Our trail started getting blocked off. 
First, a huge tree, I'm talking a couple hundred years worth of trunk and branches, was brought down onto our trail. It was then set on fire after we cut ourselves a path through it. When we weren't being deterred, they seemed to give up. Until 2018, when huge mounds of rubble started being dumped on our trail. This time, the trail was basically inaccessible. We spoke to a man who lives on the corner, who told us that he didn't want to name the farmer who was behind all of this, but that we should report it as it is illegally blocking a bridle path. We tried to report it, but the council won't go near him because he's too scary of a man. This guy told us that we were being watched and to be careful. Now this freaked us out. But us being stupid kids, we stayed from 5 p.m. till 9 p.m. clearing a path through the rubble. We also wrote F.U. in stones just for effect. The next day, there were three more piles of rubble and our path was covered over. We were at a loss, so we decided to talk to one of the neighboring farms that keeps horses. Without telling us a name, she said, you have to be careful messing with him. Around here, he's known as the man who makes people disappear. And that's when it clicked. This whole time, we'd been messing with Elliot. Farmer Bigfoot was Elliot. The same Elliot who fed his brother-in-law to the pigs. No wonder the council wouldn't go near him. Again, we tried to tell our family, but nothing came of it because they thought we were just being dramatic. Things continued happening. Bones were left on top of the rubble piles. Again, I'm guessing this was to scare us. A whole herd of sheep were stolen. The horses kept being let out. The owners of our farm would never say who they suspected, but we all knew who it was. The white pickup would turn up almost every week. We started leaving breadcrumbs on our Snapchat stories, thinking if it was weird enough for people to screenshot, we'd have multiple witnesses if anything happened to us. We told friends that if we disappeared, make the police look at Elliot. We were terrified. It quieted down after a while, until September of last year. We had just ridden, and I was leading both horses back to the field on my own. It's down a dirt track about a two minute walk from the stables. I walked through the wooded area on the track, and immediately this smell hit me. It was vile, and I knew what it was immediately. Death literal rotting flesh. It was enough to make you gag. I put the horses out and immediately ran back to Annie to come and investigate with me. The farm owner, we'll call him Ryan, overheard me and went into the house to grab a flashlight. Annie has a weak stomach, so as soon as the smell hit her, she threw up. It was so strong and so disgusting. Ryan soon joined us and said, Someone has definitely been in here. That just added to our fear. Annie had recovered from her vomiting fiasco and rejoined us in a search. Ryan then said, I really don't know what we're going to find out here, girls, but I don't think it's going to be an animal. Our fear meter was now at the max, but morbid curiosity drove us forward. After an hour of searching, we decided to unstack a pile of wooden pallets. And that's when we saw bags of white flesh. They were clear Ziploc bags. Maggots crawled inside the bags, but there were no holes, implying that whatever meat was in there had been rotting for a good while before it was cut up and put in the bags. It was the most surreal experience. After more vomit from Annie, we decided to call it a day, reassured that Ryan would now deal with whatever the hell this was. We assumed that he would have called the police. We got home and cried to our parents, but again, they dismissed it. How the hell are we being dramatic when we just found chunks of rotting flesh in the woods? Anyway, Brian is hands down one of the loveliest men on the planet. We always felt safe around him. But what we found out days later was extremely questionable. He didn't call the police. He buried the meat. He didn't throw it out. He buried it. What the fuck? 
We assume now that it's because he's old and vulnerable and he didn't want to get involved in anything that might put him or his family at risk. I still have no idea why Annie and I didn't phone the police. I'm guessing because we didn't want to cause trouble for Ryan. And no one else believed us, so why would the police? This is, unfortunately, I guess, where my story concludes. I know, how unsatisfying. I'm no longer at the farm, but I still have horses. My parents now believe everything I told them. I think maybe because I've kept telling them for the past five years. In hindsight, they wonder why the hell they didn't move the horses out of there. Annie and I are still best friends, and we reminisce from time to time about how we were stalked by a murdering farmer for nearly three years. We will never know what that meat was, or if Elliot had anything to do with it, nor will we know why he followed us all those years, trying to stop us from riding down our very own bridal path. But honestly, I'm not sure I want to know. This may be a ramble of thoughts, but after recently hearing about missing 411 and the like, I finally felt like I could offer something that my family and I experienced a few years ago that to this day gives me a shiver. Hopefully you enjoy this story. I've been camping, solo backpacking, and hunting my whole life in Oregon and felt comfortable in the woods, and I have a deep respect for nature. A few years ago, my wife, daughter, and two German shepherds went camping north of Mount Jefferson, Oregon. We found our campsite to be the perfect setup for us and our two dogs, who need the privacy, since they're intimidating to other dog owners and can be loud when spooked. It wasn't an established campsite, just a nice horseshoe off of a U.S. Forest Service road that had flat ground, full trees, and a fire pit. The first night, my daughter wanted to sleep by herself in a two-man tent right next to ours. It was maybe two feet away from my wife and I's tent. We made the male German Shepherd sleep with her in her tent. His name is Guts. That whole first night, neither my wife or I could sleep. We both heard footsteps, and they were heavy. Not like typical forest critters scampering around in the night. I was well armed because I was paranoid from having read recently before departing about a dad in California who was shot and killed in a tent next to his two infant daughters. Needless to say, both my wife and I had two pistols and I had my rifle with me. The dogs are great at detection and that's why I felt my daughter could sleep alone because Guts is completely fearless and nothing would lay a hand on her without a battle to the death. All in all, nothing but bad vibes and loud footsteps occurred that night, which I ultimately decided had to be a deer or maybe some elk. Day two, morning. We go for a walk down the road and maybe 300 feet away, we see this circle area. I see this abandoned road where a rusted gate post was covered in vegetation. The gate was missing. Something of a blue color caught my eye, and Guts immediately takes off running down this abandoned road. My heart begins to race, because I think if it's another family camping like us, he's going to get himself shot or scare some innocent people to death. So I chase after him as fast as I can, and the rest of the family follow. He stops after 20 feet into the road, and me yelling his name. But I've covered just enough distance to see that there's nobody there but there's something really off about the sight. I yell, hello, is anyone there? Sorry about the dog. I got no response. My curiosity gets the best of me and I have to see what the sight conditions are. As I get closer, I just know something is wrong. It had all the necessities for a campsite, including a cooler, propane burner, tent, blankets, folding table, everything but every single item had been completely destroyed, smashed, and torn apart from what appeared to be claw marks. We all walked around in circles, 
puzzled why anybody would leave all of their camping gear behind, including a fairly expensive REI tent. I figured, well, someone left in a hurry and the animals got to the rest. It had to be the only logical explanation, right? Still, a propane tank and a cooler were flattened by something, and it certainly wasn't snowpack with tree coverage in that spot. As the afternoon rolls in, my daughter and I are playing ball at the campsite, and my wife goes walking maybe 70 feet north to do her business. I don't have a direct line of sight on her, but all of a sudden I see Guts make a mad dash straight toward her. Normally he would always be with me, unless he's called over, and she didn't call for him. His speed and focus caught my attention, and I knew something weird was happening. So I ran over there, and my wife starts jogging at me, and I immediately draw my pistol. Guts has completely continued running into the forest another hundred feet before I call him, and he stops. My other dog, Leia, who never misses the opportunity to be the pack leader, is not taking point. I've had her for now seven years, and this was the first time in her life that she refused to leave my daughter's side. She was full hair raised and attached to us at the hip. Again, anytime we hike or play, Leah is up front, bossing everything in her path, pausing to see where we all are and then continuing on. I asked my wife what had happened, and she said, I was trying to pee and all of a sudden I felt all my hair raise. I knew someone was watching me. Then I saw Guts running toward me and I just got up to move toward you. We spent 10 minutes looking for signs of anything and saw no trails, no broken branches, nothing to point to what and where something might have gone. We decide that we're spending one more night since it's too late to pack up and drive, but we'll all be in the big tent together. Before we go to bed, I put a rope with a makeshift coin alarm around the perimeter of our campsite. I used a mint can and some coins and keys from our truck and zip tied it so that anything hitting the rope gave a little jingle. Very unsophisticated, but it put my wife at ease. As I go to tie my last corner off at a tree near our tent, our third mystery item unveils itself. It looks like someone has done the exact same thing that I have done with a rope that was so old and brown I didn't see it at first. It was broken and only a few pieces remained, but sure enough, it was tied at roughly the same height, about eight to 10 inches off the ground, and even had a few rusted washers on it. I immediately felt that someone had stayed here before and had put the same makeshift warning system on the same tree that I am, maybe 10 or 15 years ago based on the condition of the rope. Perhaps my paranoia has now reached a new height, but I had to make sure that the girls felt we were safe. And at the time, the only thing I could think of was when the evening came, I made them sit in the truck and I fired a clip of my 45 into the dirt as a signal to whatever was out there that we were armed. I reassured the girls that anybody listening to that knows that we have two wolves and are armed and are too risky of a target so we can sleep safely. That night we heard no footsteps and the dogs never perked up and barked. We left early the next morning. Fast forward to today and I watched the Amazon Missing 411 hunted documentary and I noticed the cluster smack dab close to where we camped that weekend and a flood of dread rushes at me as I think of that mysterious abandoned campsite with the ripped tent and the smashed cooler and cooktop. We've been camping since and have enjoyed the beauty of the Pacific Northwest, but there was something there at that place that possibly took or harmed someone else less than 300 feet away from where we camped. We all thank our lucky stars that Guts was doing his thing so well that afternoon. As an update, Guts is no longer with us. He has journeyed into the next phase, and there isn't a day that goes by that I don't think about him and how he likely saved us that night. He was a warrior, and his new brother, Geronimo, has his spirit.
Ben by a now deleted user posted to r slash let's not meet. I had a very creepy friend. We'll call him Ben. I believe he might be a dangerous psychopath or at worst a serial killer. Ben and I met on Facebook in 2014 and he came to meet me in Romania in the summer of 2015. He seemed a little odd at first, but otherwise okay. One strange thing about him is that while he was at my house for a week, he didn't bathe for some odd reason, so he really stank. I showed him around Transylvania, and we both rent an apartment at Bucharest before his departure. We hang around Bucharest, and he leaves. Our friendship continues online, and in 2016, I move back to Canada. In May of that year, I fly over to Vancouver to hang out with him. Now, it's important to know that this guy is a major gun nut. He collects a lot of firearms and claims to have briefly been in the Canadian Army. He also claimed that he worked as a mercenary and was in Georgia during the Russian invasion in 2008. He claimed to have shot two people there and that he suffers from PTSD. I get there and his apartment is filthy. I'm talking literal trash everywhere. Two cats that made the place stink of cat piss. This guy kept his lights on 24 seven and on his wall was a clock that played a loud tune every hour. His behavior toward me while I was there was somewhat disrespectful, but I kind of just took it as a buddy messing around with me. He said mildly creepy things, but again, I brushed it off as him being kind of an odd prankster. I leave and again, our friendship continues online. During this time, his conversations with me become darker and more hostile in a passive aggressive sort of way. Ben is also a hardcore alcoholic who drinks until he passes out most days. He does all sorts of antisocial and downright vile things while drunk. Also during this time, he said that two men briefly lived with him for a short time. When I had pressed him about what happened to those two men, he changed the subject rather quickly. After what happened in 2018, when I last met up with Ben, I have a strong suspicion that something bad might have happened to those men. Fast forward to 2018. My parents and I are driving to Vancouver from Calgary. Perfect time to meet up for a day or two with Ben. Big mistake. Ben's traveling from Kelowna to Vancouver and we met up at a bar near his house. We have a few drinks and he goes home for the night. The next day we meet up and his behavior toward me is disrespectful in that same passive aggressive way and extremely creepy. We go to his workplace and he's very subtly disrespectful to me and his coworkers. He's putting me on the spot and trying to make me look stupid to everyone around him. He was a supervisor, if you can believe it, so most of the people underneath him were too complacent or afraid to say anything. This man was obviously a psychopath. This is where it gets to a point where I believe my life was in danger. We go back to his place. He's drinking a beer and I'm rolling a joint. A movie is playing and Ben's getting tipsy. He's basically now adopted a speech pattern in our conversation where I feel like I'm being interrogated and toyed with. He's playing a video game on his computer and I'm watching a movie. By this time, I'm feeling very uneasy. My gut instinct is screaming at me to leave. Generally speaking, you always listen to your gut. That primal thing inside of you linked to fight or flight is best to be obeyed. Now as the day progressed and as Ben was becoming drunk, he started to say very weird things. He was mumbling about, I don't care for anyone but myself. I don't give a shit about people. And there's a loaded shotgun beside the table. He looks at his computer screen and he starts mumbling about being a madman with a gun. A few minutes later, he turns to me and says, Hey, what if I put some MDMA in your drink, huh? Followed by, just kidding. This sick cat and mouse game continues. He's now talking about knowing a guy who's HIV positive and how he's gonna get the guy to give him an infected needle to 
infect himself so he can live on government benefits. I mean, just unhinged stuff is coming out of this guy's mouth. I'm sitting there in complete disbelief at just how vile this guy really is. I mean, I feel physically sick. I want to leave, but I also don't want him to know that I'm ready to go. It's this awful, vulnerable feeling. He has another beer, and he turns to me. And I am now very uncomfortable. The talk is now about food. He turns to me a little bit more and looks me straight in the eyes, and he goes, So, if this was your last meal, what would you have? The look on his face was one of stone-faced sincerity and malice. I knew I had to flee. My heart's pounding. I need to make my move. With my adrenaline rushing through my body, I tell Ben in a very calm manner that the weed I had was making me feel kind of funny and I needed a breath of fresh air. I quickly put on my shoes and leave before he has any chance to stop me. While I'm going out, he makes me promise that I'll be back. I don't answer. I go downstairs into the sunlight and I feel like an animal that just escaped slaughter. The place I'm staying at is not too far from Ben's house and I'm wise enough not to tell him where I'm staying exactly. Thank God. I start walking, feeling like I've just escaped certain death. The phone rings. Ben's asking where I am and that he's panicking. I tell him, hey, I'm just still taking a breather. Meanwhile, I get to my cousin's house and somehow I manage to get inside. Night has fallen. The guy is calling my phone constantly. When I answer, he's trying to get me to meet up with him and go for a ride. But the tone of his voice is flat and fake. He says, we've just had a bad night. It's just a bad night. He's desperately trying to get me to go for a ride with him. I block his number. I block him on social media. And that was the last time I ever spoke to the scumbag. In our many online conversations over the years, Ben would always drop clues here and there about his past, that he did horrible things during this supposed gig as a mercenary, which I have trouble believing. He would go on drunken tirades about being a bad man, having done bad things. He was going to AA meetings and trying to put on this facade of normality by volunteering at an old folks home. Deep down, I think he's a psychopath, a potentially dangerous one at that. And I just hope he's never with anybody other than the two people he allegedly shot while on combat duty. Vancouver is a sketchy place full of missing people. So I guess we'll never know. Before I get into the story, there are a few things I need to explain about my country, South Africa. In South Africa, it's normal to have high brick walls with electric gates, electric fences, alarms, etc. The crime here is hectic. It's also pretty normal to have big gardens. My family and I are big animal lovers, so at the time we had six dogs, two German short-haired pointers and two dachshunds. With that being said, our dogs roam freely in and out of the garden, as it's obviously enclosed. We usually leave the veranda door open during the day for them to do their thing. Another thing about South Africa is that it's normal to have a live-in domestic worker, like a maid or a gardener. The average family usually employs them. It's not just for wealthy people. For the story, our domestic worker is Ellie and our gardener is Vince. So this happened in 2007, when I was nine years old. My older brother, who was 10, and I had just gotten our first cell phones that day. My dad surprised us after work. You may think it's a bit young, but it was used for emergencies or to communicate with our parents. Anyway, it's an important piece of information for later. We don't usually leave our veranda door open at night for security reasons. But I remember that it was a hot summer night, so, of course, this night of all nights, the veranda door was wide open, 
and the dogs were doing their thing in the garden. My brother and I were in my parents' room, setting up our new cell phones all excited. Ellie's daughter, Anne, who's like a sister to us, she was 18, was helping my brother and I. My dad was somewhere in the house and my mom was in the bath. I specifically remember Anne having a comment about how the dogs wouldn't shut up and how annoying it was. And that's when I noticed it too. I mean, sure, they would bark, but it was usually the dachshunds that yap. The bigger dogs just chilled out. Plus, it would only happen for a few minutes and then they'd get over it. Something was different that night. Even the bigger dogs were barking nonstop. My dad appeared in his room and mentioned to us that he too noticed the dog's incessant barking, and he was going to check if everything was okay. No alarm bells went off in my head, and I don't believe my dad thought anything was amiss either, because my brother asked to investigate with him and my dad agreed. I was obviously way too engrossed in my new Sony Ericsson. My dad ventured out to our garden with my brother in tow, when my dad had noticed the dogs were all grouped, growling, and going nuts at a dark corner behind our swimming pool. The best way I can describe it is that the garden beyond the pool hits like a slight decline. So we have a few steps leading down the hill to the bottom end of our garden. We usually have a lamp that lights it up, but my dad noticed how that lamp seemed to be off, which confused him because he could have sworn it was just working. Either way, my dad said that he got this gut-wrenching feeling because of all of this, and just because of how out of character the dogs were acting. He called them, and usually they would come running, but tonight, they all seemed to just look at him, then turn back around and continue going crazy at this dark corner down the steps. My dad told my brother to go back inside the house and get a flashlight sort of using it as an excuse for my brother to not come with him because of this feeling he had. When my brother went back inside to get the torch, my dad was slowly approaching the steps. He noticed how the dog seemed to be snapping at whatever it was, hiding just out of view in the darkness. As he got to the steps, he noticed the lamp was smashed. Confused, he inched toward the steps, and as he put two and two together, it was too late. My dad, being an ex-vet and avid hunter, felt something cold against his temple and immediately knew it was a gun. Out of the darkness stepped four other men in balaclavas, all armed. Shocked, he stood frozen on the steps. The man holding the gun to his head was instantly aggressive and asked him where my brother was, that he saw my dad come outside with my brother, but that my brother went back into the house. Why? My dad said something came over him, and before he knew what he was saying, he responded with, he's gone inside to press the panic button. As he said it, he saw how all of these guys started to panic. They started speaking in an African language called Zulu. He assumed that my dad couldn't understand because it's not common for white people to speak it. But my dad had actually grown up on a farm where he learned it fluently because of the farm workers. The aggressive guy holding the gun said in Zulu, shit, the cops will be here any minute. Let's just kill this effer, grab what we can and go. The other seemed apprehensive and a smaller guy seemed really on edge. He continued saying how he can't go back to jail and they need to get out of there before the cops show up, which would be any minute. He was panicking. My dad then fed on this guy's fear. My dad then interrupted them, speaking English and pretending not to understand what they were saying, and said that we usually have armed response vehicles that drive in our area, and since my brother pushed the panic button so long ago, they'll probably be here any second. And that did it. My dad watched as their plan unraveled before them. The smaller, scared guys started freaking out all the other guys, saying they had to leave right away or they'd be caught. He seemed to make the others more nervous and lose confidence until they started full-on bickering amongst themselves, their plan slowly turning to crap. The aggressive one pointing the gun to my dad's head slowly lowered it as they all started fighting, losing focus on my dad and shifting his focus onto the crew. My dad then used this as an opportunity to slowly back up the steps and turn and dart into the house. 
As luck would have it, my dad ran into the veranda door. My oblivious brother was heading out with a torch. My dad scooped him up under his arms mid-run, sprinted into the house, not even closing the door behind him. Silly, I know, but I think he was just thinking about getting my brother inside. Anne and I were obviously also oblivious to everything when my dad rushed through the bedroom door, slammed it shut, and told us to go upstairs to the attic. There's five guys outside with guns. They're here to hurt us. Get upstairs, now. My heart sank. I remember my body automatically responding and me sprinting to the stairs with Anne right behind. My mom ran out of the bathroom in a towel not too far behind. We sat there in the darkness in silence. I swear you could hear a pin drop. I think we were all just waiting to hear something below us in the rooms. My mom cursed, saying she didn't have a phone. Neither did my dad. But ha, in my hand was my brand new Sony Ericsson. No better emergency to use it in than right now, right? My mom dials the police, and I kid you not, they asked where we lived. We explained, and they said it wasn't in their jurisdiction. Sorry. Click. The line goes dead. We're now not only absolutely shitting ourselves, but we're flabbergasted too. My mom starts cursing like a sailor again, and that's when my dad realizes. Damn. He didn't close the veranda door. And what about Ellie and Vince, who are in their rooms, blissfully unaware of the danger they're in? He gets his firearm in the safe in the attic, and tells us that whatever we hear, we are not to come downstairs, to stay hidden no matter what. I'm now sobbing, begging my dad not to leave us, but he says he has to go get Ellie and Vince before something bad happens to them. Now there are even more tears, because reality hits that there are two other people still in danger. Anne is understandably in hysterics because she's also fearing for her mom downstairs. My dad disappears, and the air is thick with tension. We can still hear the dogs going crazy, indicating that those men were still on our property. My mom then calls another number, the armed security that drives around the area, and they said they'd be over in about 10 to 15 minutes. They said to wait and stay hidden until they ring our bell at the gate. We all wait in silence, fearing that we'll hear a gunshot or something indicating those men are in our house, but there was just silence. The only sound was the dogs barking outside, after what seemed like hours, but was most likely a couple of minutes, we heard stomping coming up the stairs, and my heart rate quickened. I remember shutting my eyes and just praying that it was my dad with Ellie and Vince. Luckily, it was. We all hid for a while, and nobody dared to speak. The dogs seemed to have calmed down considerably, but were still barking every now and then. The gate intercom rang and my dad told us to wait while he checked if it was the security company. And sure enough, it was. He opened up, and the nightmare was over. I remember standing up and my knees just buckling from the adrenaline my body had just endured. The armed security somehow notified the right police, and everyone investigated the garden. They found that there were actually seven pairs of footprints, and that these guys bent the spikes on our wall and just climbed right over. We got an electric fence shortly after that. So there must have been two other guys hiding in the shadows that my dad hadn't seen, which is actually creepy in its own right. South Africa's violent crime is quite bad, and it's sickeningly common for torture and other things to happen during home invasions. I was obviously so young at the time, I didn't know the horrors of the world, and I was just scared of my family getting hurt. Now that I'm older, just the thought of four women being in the house and my mom being in nothing but a bath towel gives me chills to this day. The cops said that the fact that there were so many guys instead of like one to three indicated that these guys possibly had very sinister intentions. Thank goodness nothing happened to my family and I'm forever thankful for my dad's quick thinking regarding the panic button. Also, I'm so glad my dad understands Zulu and could manipulate the situation to benefit us. Lastly, my family will forever be in debt to our good boys and girls that warned us that night, our dogs. A terrifying and life-changing outcome would have 100% happened that night had it not been for our incredible dogs.
From that day forward, my dad always gives them leftover rice or meat with their dinner. Rest in peace to all of you. I'm sure there was a special place in heaven reserved just for you angels. Close to 10 years ago, my best mate and I scored the deal of the century. Liv and her parents recently purchased and refurbished home for cheapest chips rent, so that the property wasn't considered unoccupied and their insurance would still cover it. They were planning on selling their house in the country and moving closer to town in a year. But when they spotted this place, it was perfect, so they snapped it up. They couldn't be bothered dealing with rando tenants for a year, so they offered it to us. Awesome. It was a lovely old mid-Victorian style house with a hallway running the majority of the length on the left side and three bedrooms and a bathroom coming off that hallway to the right. At the back of the house was an open plan living room and kitchen and a backyard. It was in an inner Melbourneian suburb so it was totally fenced in with six foot fences on three sides. The front had a cutesy white picket fence. On the right side of the property, an outdoor gravel pathway was wedged beside the bedroom walls and the fence line. It began with a gate in the front yard and ran the length of the property to the backyard. My mate obviously scored the master bedroom at the front with lovely vertically opening bay windows facing the front garden and street. I had the next bedroom, with a window facing the gravel path and fence. The third bedroom was our study. We lived here for close to 10 months in bliss. Great house, great company, and even though the area was considered a little dicey, the location was great. One hot summer's night, we said our good nights, and I hit the hay and zonked out immediately. My housemate stayed up in bed to read for a bit with just her bedside light on. She was doing that for just over an hour before she heard this weird scritch scratch on the front window of her bedroom. Initially, she put it down to an overhanging tree branch. That was, until she realized there was no overhanging tree branch. She sat frozen in fear, blankly staring at her book for what felt like an eternity, until she heard the noise again and again. Slowly looking up, she saw a dude wearing a hoodie trying to open her window, looking her dead in the eyes while he did it. She screamed, jumped out of bed, and ran straight into my room. I woke up super dazed as she was pulling my hand and whisper yelling that someone was trying to break in. She had a tendency to be a little overdramatic sometimes, but I swear I've never seen somebody look so genuinely terrified. I went to grab my phone to call the cops, but we just went completely still when we heard the distinct crunch, crunch of someone walking down the side path of the house. We both rolled off my bed onto the floor and went completely still. The crunching continued, getting closer and closer to my bedroom window. I don't know what it was about that distinct sound in the middle of the night when it's otherwise quiet, but it was like it was deafening. And that's when I realized why it was so loud. My window was wide open. I jumped up, slid the window down, and slammed the lock shut just as he reached it. He looked at me, but he didn't react at all. He just calmly tried to open the window, but when he realized he couldn't, he continued down the pathway to the backyard. I was thoroughly losing my mind now, and my housemate was sobbing on the floor, looking up at me like a bunny about to be torn apart by a fox. I sprinted to the back door to thankfully find it locked. I ran back to my room and called the cops. I don't know what the cops knew that we didn't, but they must have broken a land speed record to arrive all of three minutes later, lights and sirens off. We saw them go down the side path, guns drawn, straight to the backyard. There were some noises from the yard, then a knock at the back door a moment later and the police identified themselves. Turns out the dude had vaulted the back fence, quite an impressive feat, and another patrol car was headed to the next street over to look for him. The two cops at our place asked if we were okay, 
and then asked if they could come in and look around. Honestly, these cops were amazing. They managed to calm us down whilst making sure that the place was safe, and I was really impressed with how they handled the situation. I offered them a cuppa, which they politely declined, and then they took our statements and asked if there was anybody we could stay with that night. My housemate and I stayed at her boyfriend's place for a few nights after that, and when we stayed at the house, it was just never the same. We felt completely violated, and we ended up moving out a few weeks later. We never did find out if that guy was caught, but there was a random stabbing a few nights after the incident at a train station two streets over. If it was related or not, I don't really know. But all I can think is we were so lucky that that went the way it did. So it's 7 a.m. and I'm idling in a McDonald's parking lot until sunrise. The past few days with an escalating prowler have finally driven me out of my home. I'm a 25-year-old female and I live alone, on the ground floor of some cute condos with lovely neighbors. I work nights, but with the pandemic, work has been seldom. Naturally, I'm used to staying up late. Four nights ago at 2.30 in the morning, I'm watching TV in the living room, and my dog starts growling at the window. She only does this when someone or something is on my patio, and usually it's a cat or a raccoon. I assumed it was an animal outside, until I heard what sounded like somebody trying to open my door. I sat still and listened for more noise, because I just couldn't believe that that was happening. I called my mom because I was feeling weirded out, and then I peeked through my blinds, all of which were closed, by the way, to see the gate to my patio is wide open. I know I shut it, and the wind has never blown it open. I'm still on the phone with my mom, and I get the genius idea to go show whoever it is that I'm not scared, and go latch my gate while making my presence known. I go outside, and there's a man on the walkway near my patio entrance. He was walking away until he heard my door open. He fully turns around to face me and stops, staring. Average looking white guy, hoodie up, hands in his pocket, no bag. Strange, as I first assumed it was just a patio thief. But when he turned around and looked at me, I got a chill. Why would this thief show me his face? and make a point of fully turning to face me and stare. I'm shocked, and I begin walking backwards toward my door to go inside. He turns back around and keeps walking away. He takes three steps, then fully turns around again and stops to stare at me. I went inside and stayed on the phone for a couple of hours until I finally fell asleep. I called the non-emergency police and they made a note. After that first weird encounter, I put a long and low to the ground flower pot against my patio gate, so it would make a noise if somebody opened it. A couple of nights pass and I didn't notice anyone creeping about. Until last night. Last night at about 1 a.m., I hear a crashing noise. Again, I call my mom for reassurance and I look around the house to see if anything had fallen. I think it must be nothing and I get off the phone. And that is when I suddenly remember my DIY flower pot alarm. I peek through the blinds to see, yet again, my gate is open and the flower pot was knocked over. He came back. I called the non-emergency police line again, and this time they came and did a patrol of the neighborhood, but they didn't catch him. Fast forward to tonight's incident. Needless to say, I am thoroughly creeped out. I find a deal on some security cameras with motion detecting capabilities. I got to Best Buy just before closing and snagged the last pair in stock. I set those bad boys up and felt pretty safe. 1 a.m. again. I'm running a bath on the phone with my boyfriend and I get a motion detected alert from my security cameras. I assume it's just a cat because I didn't hear the gate crash. 
I had reset the flower pot system after it was knocked over the previous night. To my horror, I see a man tiptoeing from the side of my patio toward my door. Hoodie up, hands in pockets. He knew not to use the gate because it made a noise last night. It was him. He wiggles my door handle. I'm absolutely terrified because he's right there. He's back again. I throw on a long coat and run into the lobby barefoot and call 911. My boyfriend got there before the police did and was running through the back with a baseball bat looking for this creep. Unfortunately for me and lucky for him, he didn't find him. The police didn't find him either. So I'm sitting here at a McDonald's in the parking lot at 7 a.m. scared to go home. It's just all too creepy and I know to trust my gut. Why would he turn around and stare the first time? Why would he come back after he knew that I saw him? Why is he so determined to be here? I mean, he hopped the fence to avoid the loud noise of the gate and flower pot. What scares me most is how persistent and undeterred he seems by all of it. What will stop him? What's his end game? Nothing is missing from my patio. Frankly, there's nothing to steal. He never had a backpack or any kind of bag, just hands in his pockets. I have him trying the door tonight on video, so hopefully that will help him get caught. I just wish I understood the psychology of guys like this. I mean, honestly, what can I do? I'm staying at a friend's house for a few days and I'll be monitoring the cameras closely. This happened four years back. I was about 14 years old, and my parents were out and had left me and my little sister, who was 10, home alone. It was about 10 or 11 p.m. when the lights go out. This used to happen sometimes in my country, since it's a newer country and we're really poor. But that time, I noticed something out of the ordinary. Only the lights in our house were out. My neighbor's lights were on. I had a really bad feeling, so I quickly locked all the doors and closed the blinds. I told my little sister to hide behind the couch and to not go out whatever happened. I hid somewhere else with a knife and tried to call my mom. She didn't pick up, so I waited. I thought it was over, so I get out of my hiding place and I head to the kitchen, where we had the back door, to go look out the window. Before I get close, I hear the doorknob turning. It doesn't work, so the person on the other side now tries violently to open the door. That's when I panicked and shouted, Who are you? Get the F away from my house. I've called the police. I hear footsteps and then nothing. I went to the other room and looked out the window and I saw somebody running out of my backyard. My sister was crying, so I comforted her while we stayed hidden until my parents came home after about an hour. We told them everything, and my dad said that whoever it was, he had intentionally cut the house's electricity to scare us. To this day, every single time the electricity goes out, I get kind of scared. I'm just really glad we're okay. First Day Creep by user the Hounds of Love 11 posted to r slash let's not meet. This is another one of those stories where if it had happened any time recently, I would have handled it a lot differently. But of course hindsight is 2020 and everything turned out okay in the end. So I guess it's all right. About 10 years ago, I was 17 and just starting a summer job at the Jersey Shore. On my first day, one of my coworkers, 25 years old or so, hit on me. But it wasn't excessively creepy, other than I was 17, just annoying, and I figured maybe they just didn't know how old I was. 
I just figured I'd have to do my best to avoid and ignore him in the future. Other than that, the day went smoothly, and I went home. As a bit of a background, our summer house was a split level, meaning that one family lived on the first or ground floor of the house, and we lived on the second. It was an average looking house, and you couldn't really tell by looking at it that it was a split level. The only way to get to our part of the house was via steps leading up to the deck outside, our only entrance. For some reason or another, I stayed alone that night. My other family members were out of town for a reason I can't remember. So I'm outside on the deck when I see this skeezy coworker pull up outside my house. I have no idea how he found out my address. He never asked me for it, and I never gave it to him. I wasn't overly alarmed. These were pre-cell phone days in a vacation town, so it wasn't uncommon for friends and neighbors to stop by without notice. However, I didn't feel like dealing with him, so I went inside before he could see me, not even locking the door. Our house also had big picture windows, so everything was evident in the house's main living area, so I headed down the hallway. For some reason, I went into the bathroom instead of my bedroom, which ended up being lucky because my bedroom door didn't have a lock, but the bathroom did. I'm in the locked bathroom, waiting to hear if he's going to knock. I'll just use the name Chris because I don't actually remember his real name anymore. But instead of knocking, I hear him come straight up the deck stairs. I mean, he must have seen me, right? Why wouldn't he go to the main front door? The front door was open, because remember I had forgotten to lock it. But he just waltzed right into the house without even knocking. I could hear it. I could hear him walking around, calling my name out. He even tried the handle on the bathroom. Thank God I had locked it. He eventually leaves but this is only the beginning. Now at this point, of course, I should have called the cops. Someone broke into my house, but I was young and dumb and scared of the consequences at work. I didn't want to be that girl who called the cops on her coworker after her first day when he was trying to be friendly or something. Again, if this happened today, I would never have let it escalate the way it did, but such is the case with many of these stories. Hopefully, it can be a lesson to others. Now the phone calls begin. Again, I didn't give him my number. I assumed that he somehow got the information from work. I didn't answer the phone or take it off the hook, because I thought that might signal him that I was home. I counted 11 messages. He called over 30 times that night and left 11 messages. The messages he left on the machine were so creepy. It would just be silence, and then he would just say my name, which I'll use a different name. Daisy? Daisy, are you there? Are you there, Daisy? Daisy, are you there? Every time, over and over and over. I saved the messages in case I needed them as proof of something. At this point, I locked the door and closed all the blinds, except the front door, which didn't have one, so I put a towel over it. And the phone calls keep coming, and he returns to the house three more times. I hear him trying the door downstairs, throwing pebbles at the window, circling the house. Again, I should have called the cops, but part of me thought that he was just really socially awkward and didn't realize that what he was doing was way over the line but I didn't want to confront him either, regardless of whether his intentions were to murder me or say hello. I eventually called my mom, and she could hear the fear in my voice. She ended up driving for two hours to come rescue me, but in the meantime, I was still dealing with his phone calls and attempts to get into the house. I was afraid to leave the house even to go to a friend's house, because I figured he would just be waiting outside. Again, there's only one way in and one way out of our part of the house. Eventually, I hear more footsteps on the deck, again, and I'm pretty much in tears at this point. I'm so scared. Luckily, it ended up being two friends randomly stopping by, 
and I have never been so happy to see them. We quickly went to their car after I quickly explained what was going on, and I spent the night at their house. The following day, my mom and I went to the police station to file a report. I was afraid he would return. What's creepy was that when I told the cops his name, they were all, oh yeah, we know that guy. I was supposed to go to work that morning. My mom went with me, and we told the manager what had happened the night before. To his credit, the manager said, well, we don't need people like that working here, and immediately found Chris and fired him. I didn't tell everybody my story, but word got around, and fortunately everybody at work was really supportive. Luckily, nothing further happened after that, but what bothered me about the whole thing was that for a long time it made me afraid to be alone, and I cringed every time the phone rang. But in a way, it's also given me enough confidence not to get into a situation like that again, at least to not let it go on so long before I call the cops. My first and last day on the job by user Alexi to r slash let's not meet. This happened last year, around September. I was given a job at my campus's main dining hall. I was in charge of inventory. It was just a 15 hour a week job that I had taken to get a little extra money, and it wasn't hard at all. I just counted the number of plates, cups, miscellaneous items, food items, etc. After that, I chilled until my shift ended, usually around 10 p.m. It was my first day, or night, on the job. My supervisor was a jerk. He told me what to do and then just went home. He left me there to do everything myself at around 7 p.m. It was already dark, but I did what he said. The place was creepy when it was empty. I finished in about 45 minutes, so I sat around bored in the darkness. I played a few hundred thousand games of Angry Birds, still had an hour and a half until the end of my shift. So I did what anyone would do, I went into the kitchen. The kitchen area was huge, wrapping around half of the building. I went into the freezer area to see what was there, and that's when I heard a bang from the front part of the kitchen. It scared me so badly that I slipped and fell. The floor was slick in the freezer. I crawled out on all fours to see what it was. When I looked, I saw nothing but a silent figure darting back and forth in the darkness. I immediately flipped out because the dark figure was bounding toward me. It grew larger and larger until I jumped up and turned the lights on. I was immediately staring into a pair of eyes. It was Roger, one of the cleaning staff members. My supervisor had mentioned that the cleaning staff came in later, but Roger was about four hours early. But I knew Roger. We were both juniors then, and I had a few classes with him. He was a sweetheart but I don't think he was all there, if you know what I mean. He just seemed off, but he always said hello to me and I to him. But I remember asking him rather brashly, what the F are you doing here? And he just smiled, laughed, and shrugged. He didn't say a word, and I was pretty creeped out by the whole thing. And then he told me he heard I got a job there and wanted to keep me company. I told him I was fine, he didn't leave right away, and I'm not the type of person to be incredibly mean and upfront, so I let him stay for a while. Roger and I ended up talking about our classes and stuff like that. I realized he just needed a friend and I was happy to be that. But the end of my shift came and I told Roger that I was leaving. I only had to go down to the basement level and turn off the heating and air conditioning unit, which is what people in charge of inventory did as part of closing procedures. Roger said his goodbyes and then left. I went downstairs without thinking about it. Later, while returning from downstairs, I hear a door slam and heavy footsteps, and Roger was standing at the top of the stairs. He told me a strange man was outside and that he would walk me to my car. 
I stopped, hesitated, and then nodded. I trusted Roger. He was harmless, or so I thought. I texted my boyfriend and I told him I was on my way home. My phone, conveniently enough, died right after that text was sent. I gathered my things, but I couldn't find my wallet. I had left it at the front desk, but it wasn't there. I looked around and retraced my steps and spent 30 to 45 minutes looking. Roger joined in to help. He pretended it was some kind of game and laughed about it the whole time. I was growing uncomfortable and very agitated because I couldn't find my freaking wallet. As Roger bent down to look under a table, I saw the tip of my wallet poking out of the back of his pants. He had had my wallet the entire time. But I felt uneasy about the whole thing. Why did he go along with this joke for so long? I called him out on it, beyond pissed off. I told him rather abrasively to give me my wallet back, and he held it out in front of me like I was a dog and he was holding a toy. I thought, you only have five dollars in your student ID in there. You can get a new ID for about ten, just let him have it. So I turned around, grabbed my keys, and hauled out of there. I turned around and was instantly barreled over by Roger. I hit the pavement outside the dining hall hard enough to daze me. He was just laughing and laughing and my vision was spinning. I pulled myself up and Roger was pushing me around, almost taunting me. I started wailing. I mean straight up Jamie Lee Curtis screaming. Roger shoved me hard enough to cause me to fall again and I just got up and ran across the parking lot. He was much larger than me and much faster. He ran along beside me and just laughed in my face. I didn't even run to my car. I ran out into the middle of the highway and screamed for everything I was worth. Roger ran up to me just as campus security sped and then stopped beside him. They asked what the problem was, but I was hyperventilating and having a full-blown panic attack. Roger swore repeatedly that he was just trying to return my wallet. Still, I finally got it together enough and just screamed, he was chasing me and he took my wallet and he won't leave me alone, and blah blah, damsel in distress, tears, you know the rest. They took Roger in and my boyfriend came and saved the day for me. After they watched the security footage, Roger left campus after that. I never heard what happened, and honestly I didn't care, and I vowed never to work another overnight job alone, again. It was pretty freaking terrifying. My first and last week at 7-Eleven by Sand F. Posted to r slash ask reddit in a comment. It wasn't the first day, but the first week of a job at 7-Eleven. If you're not familiar, it's a 24-hour convenience store. I spent my first week stocking shelves, carrying heavy stuff, and cleaning. It was crap work for crap pay, and to this day, I don't think time moves slower anywhere in the universe than in a 7-Eleven. But hey, it was a paycheck. Some people had worked in that location for 10 years or more, a loyalty to soul-sucking struggle that I cannot even begin to fathom. So about a week into the job, the day I was to have gotten my first paycheck, I arrived at work where there was a meeting or kerfuffle about the register being short the previous night. Apparently it was store policy to split the short among the people on duty when it happened. So basically they were telling me that the two people at the front of the store working registers and me, the bottle-stocking, floor-mopping, labor monkey, were responsible for making up the difference, of which my share was my whole paycheck. Of course, I had yet to come near the register during my shift of mopping and carrying milk crates. If the register was short, I wasn't responsible for that. But the store owner informed me that my share was being docked from my pay, which again was my entire check. 
I spent about 15 minutes trying to reason with these brick wall morons, how I wasn't even near the register and I bore zero responsibility for it. It ended up with me telling her that I wasn't willing to pay a dime for someone else's mistake or dishonesty. That didn't go over so well. And they all, especially the register people, who I have always suspected pocketed the money, insisted that that was how it always worked. The jerk owner even suggested that I might have stolen all the money, which was complete crap. I told her if she accused me of theft, she'd better produce some evidence. Since I didn't steal or even go near the register, she should pull her security camera videos and see for herself. After that false accusation, I quit on the spot. The jerk never did pay me. Of course, the loyal morons working at the register continued to work there. For all I know, they're still there, probably stealing people's register money and making the newbies pay for it. And even now, that lost paycheck isn't even a factor, not even worth a rounding error. I still recall my bitterness at the unfairness of it all. I grew up in the countryside, right next to a national park frequently visited by nature lovers and bird enthusiasts. It was the kind of park where you're not really allowed to bike or ride horses, only walk or run. But 10-year-old me thought that was a stupid rule, and I did so anyway, because the trails were perfect for it. I knew full well that I wasn't supposed to do that, and I was caught a few times, but nothing much came of it apart from a half-hearted, don't do it again. And I did, of course, until one day something frightening happened that made me stop. My family were horse breeders, and I would often take one of the horses for a ride, usually in the Forbidden Park. This day, very early in the morning, the first day of the summer holiday, it was beautiful outside. Misty and foggy, yet a sky that promised a sunny day ahead. Since it was so early, before six o'clock, I knew there wouldn't be anybody on the trail to see me, so I let the horse set off full speed along the trail. I only slowed down on the part of the trail that got steep on one side leading down to the river, because the thought of one step too close to the edge was too much even for a kid with the next and non-existent risk assessment skills. Suddenly the horse came to a halt and refused to go any farther. I grew up with horses all my life, and I knew that that usually indicates you need to investigate. Is there something with the hooves? Did the horse spot something that spooked it? The hooves were fine, but the horse wouldn't move an inch. And that's when I saw it. Someone had set up a trap, a thin, sharp metal wire across the trail at perfect neck height for an adult. I stopped and looked around, but I didn't see anybody. The wire was well attached to two trees and impossible for me to remove. So I led the horse around it. And to do so, I had to walk a bit up into the wooded area on the side of the trail. This is when I heard singing. There's a song called Hey Tom to Gubar, and it was that melody, but the lyrics were different and sung in a muffled, sniggering voice. Today, I only remember parts of it, but it translated into something like, hey all you runners come here passing, let the lifeblood pour out. I, as silently as I could, and with my heart in my throat, backed away, got up onto the horse, and hurried back the way I'd come as fast as I could. I knew that I had to tell somebody about it but at the same time, I wanted to avoid admitting to riding a huge and very forbidden horse on those protected trails, so now I had a problem. The old stories about a man living in the shed in the woods, a shed that was once a cottage for the local hunter, came back to me as I hung onto the horse for dear life. I got home and I told my older brother what had happened, and he went back there with me in tow. We found the wire trap, and after a while of searching, 
we also found a spear-like pole in the ground, right on the spot where you would land if you came running and jumped over the fallen tree on the trail. That's when we called the police. The area was searched and several similar traps were found, but there was no sight of the old man. The following summer though, there was big news in the local paper about spear-like poles being found right under the water surface, directly under that little tower you're supposed to dive from at the lake. And black garbage bags filled with big rocks were found on the narrow bridge crossing the river, so that if a car had hit it, chances are it would have gone off the road and into the water. Long story short, someone out there in the woods was making human traps. And I just about ran into one. A Man Hunted Me Through a National Park by user Valerian Jedi posted to r slash let's not meet. I was camping in the middle of nowhere in Washington, near Mount Rainier. Not in an official campground, but way out in the forest, where I wouldn't have expected another human for miles. One night, I woke up and heard something, opened my tent, and there was a guy sitting by where my fire had been, right outside my tent. There was nothing particularly noteworthy about the guy, just a fairly regular looking dude sitting there a couple of feet from my tent. He had no bag or pack with him, just a guy. He saw me open the tent, his eyes got huge like he had just seen a ghost, and he took off. It shook me up pretty badly, but over the next day I managed to put it out of my mind fairly well, after writing it off as just some odd occurrence and a guy who was probably disoriented or something, and had somehow managed to set up camp coincidentally not far from mine. Then, two days after that, and 10 to 15 miles away in a totally random direction that nobody could have taken the same path as by accident, I was sitting by the fire that night and started hearing noises. I got very convinced that these were coming from a person. I called out to them, and out of the darkness, someone was like, Do you know how to get to Bell's Canyon? I said, No, I don't even think that's a real place. They kept talking from just out of my line of vision. I tried to see them with my flashlight, but they yelled, Aim that away, and kind of spooked, and not wanting to provoke a potentially unstable person, I did. After about 15 minutes of me being very freaked out, and them talking and asking completely random questions from the darkness, it sounded like the voice had gotten closer. So I shined my light that way again, and it was the same dude who'd been outside my tent two nights before. He had to have followed me almost 15 miles over two days, because there's no way he could have just accidentally wound up in the same spot as vast as that wilderness is. No possible way. As soon as my light hit him, he took off again. I started to chase him, but I didn't want to get lost in the wilderness in the dark. So I stopped quickly after probably only 100 to 200 feet. This one couldn't be written off, because the only way he could have been in both places is specifically if he was following me. I decided the trip was very over the first thing in the morning, and I hiked back out over three days, constantly doubling back, trying to throw anybody that was following my trail. Occasionally I hid, and I waited to see if he would come by, following me. I really can't describe how terrifying it was to feel like I was being tracked through the woods, and to actually have to brainstorm on things I could do to best avoid potentially being harmed. On the first night of hiking out, twice I heard what sounded like a person walking in circles outside my tent. But by the time I mustered the courage to look, nobody was there. On the second night, I heard what I thought was an animal making noises at first, in the distance, but very slowly, 
I started to realize it was a human making animal calls. Either way, I never actually saw the guy again. It really sounded like a person making those howling noises. I literally almost cried when I finally got back to my car. The relief was so strong. To this day, it's probably the most terrifying experience I have ever had. I have no idea who that guy was or what his intentions were and no way of getting an explanation but I really cannot articulate in words just how terrifying those few days were. I thought it was my roommate, I wish it was, by a now deleted user posted to r slash let's not meet. This is my brother's girlfriend's story. She doesn't have a Reddit account, but I told her about this sub and she wanted to share her experience because it's unsettling and also a learning opportunity. I attended school in a large city that's considered one of the less safe places in the US. I chose this institution for its nursing program, not for its location. I live in a row house off campus with four other girls. It's cheaper and nicer than the dorms, or so we thought. I guess you get what you pay for. We're all college sophomores, and as you might expect, we go out and have drinks, and when we come back, I guess we don't always remember to do the things we should. We had just started our lease in August. The house has three floors plus a basement that was padlocked by the owners. Understandable, since we would definitely host parties there to avoid cleaning up right away. The house was great, conveniently located near the school and my job. I'm a certified nursing assistant who works odd hours. This is important for later. It was affordable and in a good condition. Having previously lived with just one roommate, it was a new experience to live with so many people and to notice if something was out of place. I started noticing that my snacks were either half gone or completely missing. I was getting really annoyed, but in a house with so many people, it seemed like too much effort to figure out who was responsible, so I ignored it. Gradually, we began making passive-aggressive comments about somebody eating our food, but we all let it go to avoid a full-blown argument. I work until about 11 p.m. in the NICU. Usually, I get home around 11.30 p.m. on weeknights. I began to find pans left out, or snack wrappers around, which was kind of odd, since none of my roommates had ever done that before. I thought maybe they had a drink and just forgot to clean up. The comments from my roommates become more frequent. We start to inquire more directly of each other, because the disappearing food and messes were becoming bothersome. I suspected one of them, but who wants to admit to eating someone else's snacks in college, where snacks are highly prized? We suspected the girl who often indulges and consumes a lot of food. She denies it's her. The situation persists for about two months, with it becoming increasingly clear that somebody was taking our food. I really wish it had been the girl we suspected. One night, I was delayed at work and I didn't leave until 12.30 in the morning. I took the bus home, carrying pepper spray, a taser, and a pocket knife for safety. I was exhausted. I just wanted to go to bed as soon as possible. Upon entering the front door, which leads to a view of the kitchen, I noticed there's someone else there, but I was too tired to initiate a conversation, thinking that it could lead to a lengthy, potentially pointless discussion, so I headed straight upstairs. I noticed, though, all my roommates' doors are closed, which usually means they're either in their rooms or asleep. Something was off. I texted our house group chat to ask if anybody was still in the kitchen, feeling silly for even asking. Two replied no and confirmed that the others were asleep. Realizing it wasn't any of my roommates in the kitchen, I hesitated before finally calling 911. I quietly entered my roommate's room across the hall, 
and whispered that I thought somebody was in our house. She was visibly alarmed and hadn't suspected a thing, even though we lived in a neighborhood where a shooting had occurred just two doors down weeks earlier. She signaled for me to make the call. As we waited in silence, I doubted what I saw, fearing that I would look foolish when the police arrived and found nothing. The police arrived promptly due to the city's reputation for danger. I was reluctant to go downstairs, even after the dispatcher confirmed their identity. My heart was racing. The police conducted a search, and I dreaded appearing foolish. They asked about additional floors, and we mentioned the basement, although it was supposedly secure. To our shock, they discovered a man had been living in our basement. The padlock was tampered with, but appeared intact if you weren't looking that closely. And we rarely inspected that area closely. Why would we? We weren't allowed in it. The intruder had taken a comforter from a hallway closet, acquired a mattress from an unknown source, and was the one disturbing our belongings and consuming our food. He had grown bolder over time, perhaps due to drug use or indifference. Given our regular schedules, he likely felt it safe to emerge after midnight. None of us locked our bedroom doors at night, which honestly is the most unsettling aspect of this entire thing. He could have accessed our rooms at any time, and none of us would ever have known. I was almost a missing person by a now deleted user posted to r slash let's not beat. I apologize in advance because I'm not a very good writer. I'll do my best to share my experience. To better paint the picture, here is a description of myself at the time of this incident, three years ago at the time of this writing. About 5'5", 26 year old woman with medium length bleach blonde hair curvy, 175 pounds, wearing black high-waisted tights and a pink crop top. Three years ago, I was walking home late at night from my friend's house. It was dark, and at the time I lived in a pretty rough part of a large city. I've had many sketchy situations that I've gotten myself out of, so I guess I felt kind of invincible, like nothing truly scary could happen to me. When I walk alone, I always stay very alert and aware of my surroundings, for my own safety, just in case. About halfway home, and roughly 10 minutes to my apartment, I noticed a van started tailing me. I was used to this, actually, since in my city, it's very common for a young woman in a rough area to get propositioned for activities. It's embarrassing how desensitized to this I was. I did my usual and crossed the road to walk beside the traffic, heading in the other direction. I wasn't scared, honestly, I was just annoyed. The van then turned down a side street, then back onto the road that I was on, and pulled up to me. At this point, I still wasn't scared. Again, this has happened so many times, and it never mattered if I was wearing something that showed more skin or a winter coat zipped from just below my chin down to my ankles. That area is notorious for that type of activity. I decided to cut to the chase and be firm, and I told the person sternly, I'm not interested. I noticed there were two men in the van. They looked almost identical. They might have been twins or brothers. Both men had a very dark complexion, dark eyes, and short dark hair. The van didn't move. I was super annoyed again and crossed the road once more to get away. At this point, I figured that would be enough for them to stop following me. They didn't. They kept circling back every time I crossed the road. I have never had to put that much effort into getting a horny pervert to leave me alone. So this is when I started to feel unsafe. They zipped by me at the speed the traffic was flowing in and I yelled at them to F off. I thought it finally worked, 
It had been like three minutes, and I hadn't seen the van, so I thought I was in the clear. Just in case, though, I pulled out my phone, and I got ready to call my sister, whom I live with. Just then, the van pulled up to me very quickly, and before I could even blink, one of the men jumped out of the truck, opened the back door, and quickly approached me in a very aggressive manner, as if he was about to scoop me up and throw me into the vehicle. The traffic in that area is very inconsistent. It was dead, and I imagine that's what they'd been waiting for. Just as the man was about to place his hands on me, and I don't know where this came from, I tilted my phone and I said, you're being filmed in my live video chat. I gave my friends your license plate number and the police have been notified. I was so scared, but I didn't let it show. I stayed as calm as I could. The man paused as if he was considering whether I was bluffing or telling the truth. So I tilted the phone more to give the fake audience a better look at him. He then jumped into the van and they sped off. I have never been the same since that night. I'm afraid of walking alone now, even in the daytime. Stay safe out there. My ex-housemate might have been a serial killer by a now deleted user, posted to r slash let's not meet. This story is a bit complex, so bear with me as I try to relay everything I remember about what led me to suspect that my former housemate could potentially have been a serial killer, or at least one in the making. It was the summer of 2015 when I moved in. At first glance, my housemate and landlord, Mike, seemed somewhat normal, albeit socially awkward and maybe a bit dysfunctional. When I was signing the lease, he made it clear that I should never, for any reason, go into the basement. I found this odd, but I really needed a place to stay. And people have their quirks, so I initially brushed it off. As time went on, and I got to know Mike better, I began to see the extent of his dysfunction. First off, he used hard substances. I don't typically judge people based on their vices, but I was really taken aback by just how much he used. He was the first person I knew who used this substance while maintaining a full-time job and achieving a decent amount of success. This detail is important because when he was around the house drinking and using this substance, he would start to make disturbing jokes. He often mentioned that if I ever smelled lye coming from the basement, I shouldn't think anything of it. After he repeated this several times, I asked him why he kept saying that, and he replied with a wily grin, I use chemicals to clean up after the bodies. I tried to dismiss this as a bad drug-fueled joke, but it just didn't sit right with me. He also insisted on knowing my schedule and when I would be coming and going. One day, when I unexpectedly stayed home from work, he seemed shocked and uncomfortable, probably because he didn't know I was home. That day, there was a lot of noise and what I swear sounded like muffled shouting coming from the basement, even though his car was in the driveway and he wasn't in the main house or his bedroom. Other times, he would play loud music or NPR talk radio at high volumes, likely to mask sounds. His comments about sex workers were particularly alarming, suggesting that violence toward them was inconsequential. At one point while doing laundry, I caught a whiff of what I can only describe as decomposition coming from the garage. Knowing the house was relatively new, and we were in southeast Portland and not like upstate New York or something, I found this odd. I decided to confront Mike about it, half-jokingly saying that he needed to do a better job cleaning up the bodies because of the smell. His reaction was a mix of fear and anger, and after a brief and awkward exchange, he quickly retreated to his bedroom. Mike spent a lot of time in that padlocked basement, which only had access from the backyard. 
His comments about women and sex workers became more graphic and explicit. His drug use increased. He also once showed me a very disturbing video he had made, the details of which I will leave out here, but it was pretty bad. In October of 2016, I left to join the anti-pipeline protests with Standing Rock Lakota. My last night there, Mike, under the influence, made more thinly veiled references to killing people and violence of a certain nature. I bluntly told him he would be caught eventually. His response was cold and serious, a stark contrast to his previous pretense. Haunted by the experience, I eventually called Portland Crime Stoppers and shared my suspicions. The call seemed to pique the interest of the police, and they took down detailed information about Mike and his property. Recently, I shared this story with my mother, who looked up the house on Google Maps. We noticed a large enclosed trailer in the driveway that wasn't there during my time. While this could purely be conjecture, it did raise further questions in my mind. Having grown up in tough circumstances and encountered many sketchy individuals, none have left an impression on me quite like Mike did. My nighttime habit saved my life by a now deleted user posted to r slash let's not meet. This happened two nights ago, so I'm still replaying it over and over in my head. I thought this would be a good place to share. I'm a fairly predictable person with a predictable schedule. So I'm not sure if this was a random occurrence or if somebody knew my nightly routine. I'm a 35 year old woman. My husband Rob gets up for work hours before me so he goes to bed before I do. I usually get to bed a few hours after he does, around the same time every night. I turn off the lights and the TV in the living room, and I take my dog to the back door to let her out. She's tiny, old, and poses zero threat to anyone. The door leads to a large deck outside. Off to the right of the deck are a few steps down and a small path to the gate which we always keep chained and locked. Every single night before opening the door, I peek out of the window right next to it without disturbing the blinds and I flip on the deck light. I never expect anyone to be there and we've never had a problem with trespassing or break-ins. It's just something I do every night. It's kind of like peeking behind the shower curtain before I pee. I know nobody's back there, but if I don't check, that's gonna be the one time someone actually is there, you know? Hey, listen, I watch a lot of horror movies and it's pitch black outside at night where I live, so gotta be safe. Anyway, a few nights ago, I got ready for bed. I went to the back door with my dog slowly following behind me. I peeked out the window. I flipped on the light and my heart jumped into my throat. I saw a skinny, dirty guy in his 30s or 40s standing off to the side of the door, facing it. I see him raise his arm up and hold a screwdriver above his head as soon as the light went on, preparing for someone to open the door. I just screamed, Rob, get up, get the gun, as loud as I could, which startled the guy. He jumped over the rail of the deck, even though he was right next to the stairs, and ran. My husband ran out of our bedroom with his gun. He called the police and they showed up in like five minutes. They drove around trying to find the guy, but no luck. The guy broke the lock on our gate to get in. He also pried open the back screen door, which we always keep locked as well. If I had opened that door without looking first, I might be dead. We all might be, I don't know. I don't know if I caught the guy trying to break in or if he was waiting for me to open the door, like I do every night. Either way, it was extremely terrifying. My parents are buying us outdoor security cameras this week as an early birthday present for Rob. Hopefully, we don't see that guy on those cameras or anywhere. 
ever again. Odd Neighbors by a now deleted user. Posted to r slash let's not meet. We've been in this house almost two months now. I love it. Five acres, a lovely home, great place to raise my kids. Then I met the neighbor across the road. Turns out his daughter lives to our left. Nephew to our right. Sister, two houses one way. Brother, three houses the other way. Not uncommon, but still interesting to learn. The guy is 82, but looks and acts like he's 60. He's also the most racist, sexist person I have ever met. He told us that our yard must be mowed every five days. This is farmland, there is no homeowners association, and my yard is a hayfield that we're bailing. He said I was not to address him directly, because I'm a woman, but to have my husband call or to go through his wife if we needed anything. He said I should grow my hair out to look more motherly. I just smiled and nodded, attributing his attitude to his age. Days later, there was a knock at the door. A gentleman introduces himself as the neighbor diagonally across the street. He hands me a Bible, says everyone on the street attends a certain church, and his smile is all teeth. Everything about him just screams sleazeball. He turns, still grinning, to walk down my porch steps, and then before he can answer, says, See you there on Sunday. Saturday, my husband is outside when a car pulls up. The first neighbor's wife, and I kid you not, walks right into my house like she owns the place, gasps at the Halloween decorations, and asks to speak to the woman of the house privately outside. Yeah, outside sounds like a great idea, I snapped, more than a little agitated. Again, I consider age. Among the topics were, you need to mow the yard. My husband's going to tell yours that you've been driving and walking out of the yard to get the mail. Um, you need to take down those skeletons, they're vulgar. I will be babysitting your infant son twice a week for five hours since he is the first fresh blood in the area in a long time. Her words exactly. At this point, my mama bear becomes way stronger than my southern manners so I stand up and tell her to leave. She seems unfazed, telling me I need to be more ladylike. So I tell her, leave or I call the cops. She huffs and leaves. She and her husband have parked in the road, and they've stared down my house twice now. The church fellow has left us handwritten letters in our mail every week since the first Sunday, all saying, we missed you at church this Sunday. You need to be there this week. I already went to this backwoods useless cop for whatever good it did me. I literally feel like I moved into a wrong turn movie. At this point, I don't know what I'm going to do, but holy crap. Please come out by user Meanwhile in Paris, posted to r slash let's not meet. This story happened a few years ago. I was in my early 20s and studying in Paris, France. I was going home from university. I usually took a short bus ride and walked the rest of the way. That day, I felt slightly uncomfortable. I could sense some guy looking intensely at me. I was used to unpleasant, unsolicited gazes, but this time, his gaze felt beastly. It's hard to explain why, but I felt like prey being stalked something I'm not actually prone to feeling. I decided to get off the bus a few stops early. I wanted to avoid him, and I didn't want him to see where I usually got off. Like I learned in the movies, I waited until someone else pressed the stop button, and I waited until the last moment to stand up and leave. 
I didn't notice him getting off the bus. Just as I was feeling the relief of having escaped an uncomfortable situation, I looked over my shoulder and there he was, a few meters behind. I had the distressing feeling that his eyes had just looked away the moment I turned. I walked into a shop, took my phone and pretended to be taking a call. When I couldn't see him anymore, I exited and I made my way home as fast as I could. I kept looking back on the busy street. I zigzagged, crossing the street at every crossing. Finally, I believed that him getting off at the same stop as me was just a coincidence. And for some reason, maybe I was just way over-dramatizing this whole thing. When I reached my building, I looked back one last time, and there he was, his alarming gaze on me, smirking. I ran up to my apartment, climbing those stairs four at a time. I reached the top floor, squeezed through my door, and locked it. And then I froze. My intercom was ringing. Don't ask me why I picked it up. I regretted it the moment I did. I could hear the opposite flat intercom ringing as well. He had pressed every button one by one, hoping somebody would open. But now he knew my name. Gabrielle, oh shit. I felt like a deer in the headlights, frozen. Open the door, please, said a pleading voice. I just wanna talk to you. Somehow I couldn't move or speak. Come to the window. He added, look at me, you'll see I'm not a bad guy. Something clicked. He wanted to locate my apartment in the building. I had already made a couple mistakes, but I wasn't gonna make that one. I hung up in shock. I waited by the door without moving for what seemed like hours. When I finally managed to calm myself, I called my long distance boyfriend. Call the police, he said immediately. Why didn't I call the police? I don't know. Today it would be the first thing I would do. The fear of making a big deal out of something unimportant, perhaps. What an idiot I was. I called my best friend instead. I didn't want to feel alone. I told her all about it, and after a while I felt better, safe. We started laughing. Suddenly, the intercom rang again. Two hours had passed since I had come home. I answered. Gabrielle, said the voice, open please. I still just remember the chills I felt. He was still there. He was there this whole time. I was silent, petrified. He was silent, but I could sense his trepidation. Gabrielle, let me in, I'm so thirsty he said. Just give me a glass of water. This broke the tension. I hung up. I curled up in a corner, literally in the fetal position, terrified. I waited. I was scared to make a sound. I knew he couldn't hear me from the hall, but I was scared to even breathe. The intercom rang again, and again, and again. I stopped answering. I crouched on the sofa and fell asleep out of pure exhaustion. I heard the intercom ring one more time, in the middle of the night. I woke up in the morning afraid to leave my apartment. I called my dad who came to pick me up. There was nobody in the hall, but there was a note in my mailbox. Gabrielle, I'm a nice guy. You should have opened up for me. We immediately went to the nearest police station. The police listened and, of course, told me that I should not hesitate to call them. My dad called a locksmith to install a digicode on the building door the same day and wrote a message to each of my neighbors, asking them not to open the door to anyone they didn't expect. He sat in the cafe in front of my building with two friends every evening for more than a week. I never saw this stalker again. After this episode, I used a different route to and from university every day. I kept my phone tightly in my hand, and I looked back every few meters. Today, I'm still very observant of my surroundings. I never answer the door if I'm not expecting someone. 
So, if you ever find yourself in any kind of uncomfortable situation, call the police. Don't be like me. Be safe, everyone. The Fake Girl Scout Cookie Salesman by a now deleted user, posted to r slash let's not meet. Years ago, when I was 11, I was staying home alone with only my little brother, who was seven. At that time, it was about 9 p.m., dark and pouring rain, and we were reading in our room, which was right next to the front door, with a big window and open blinds. That's when I heard the front doorbell ring, followed by knocking. I just thought my parents had arrived, although it was odd that they didn't just use the garage or their keys. I looked outside to see their car, but it wasn't there. All I saw was rain. As I approached the door, I heard a man's voice, very distinct from my father's, yelling through the downpour, Would you like some cookies? We're selling Girl Scout cookies. I was stunned given the weather and the time of day. Saying nothing, I checked the peephole and I peered through the side window, expecting to see a father with his daughter. My heart dropped. Standing there was just a fully grown man, perhaps in his late fifties, with not a box of cookies in sight, soaking on the doorstep. That gut-wrenching feeling of having to check the locks while he was right on the other side was unforgettable. Surely he heard this. The two locks were the only things separating my brother and me from a potential threat. He continued to knock and mentioned the cookies, prompting me to consider calling the police. That's when I remembered the blinds were open in my room where my brother was, with the light on. As I turned the corner into the doorway, I saw the man carefully peering into our window possibly eyeing my brother who was distracted by his book. My heart was pounding and panic set in. Summoning all the willpower I could, I quickly turned off the lights and ran over to the window to close the blinds, fully visible to the man. As fast as I could, I double checked all the locks in the house, closed all the blinds, and I told my brother to go hang out in one of the big closets in the interior of the house. There were no windows. I didn't tell him what was happening to avoid frightening him, and for some reason I never did call the police or my parents. I just waited in the hall until he left. Reflecting on it still sends shivers down my spine, thinking of how many things could have gone wrong that night. My greatest fear since then is a stranger reaching an unlocked door before I do. I'm a strong believer in listening to my gut. I always have been and always will be, since it's gotten me out of a few situations. One was my freshman year of high school. School had ended for the day, and since I was staying at my dad's house that week, I decided I would walk home. His house wasn't that far from school. Everything was fine until I turned down the street where there's a shortcut. It led straight into my neighborhood. As I was walking to the shortcut, a man drove by staring at me. My stomach dropped and turned. I took this as a note to walk a bit faster. By the time I got into my neighborhood, the man was circling around the cul-de-sac, waiting for me. He had a smirk slowly creeping onto his face as I walked by his car. I tried to ignore him the best I could and just kept walking. He would drive past me and yell vulgar things at me. He kept turning around and driving past me again and again. As I turned down my street, he followed closely behind. I saw him drive down my street and turn into someone's driveway to turn back around. I quickly got into my house and locked the door behind me. 
I then turned around to look through the peephole so I could see if he left. He didn't. The man pulled up into my driveway and got out of the car. Luckily, my neighbor, who's a family friend, was out in his garage. He came over yelling at the man and then stayed with me until my dad got home. A week later, my dad told me he saw the man parked at the end of the street, waiting for me. He went and threatened the man and we haven't seen him since, but I'm still freaked out every time I go and visit my dad. It's safe to say I won't be walking home alone ever again. Oversleeping may have saved my life by a now deleted user posted to r slash let's not meet. I've told this story in other places on other accounts before, but it bears repeating. One day when I was an elementary schooler, I think probably third or fourth grade, I was awoken by my mom in a rush. She had overslept. And since she always woke me up in the morning, this meant I overslept as well. And now there was just no way that I was going to be ready for school early enough to get on the school bus. If I remember correctly, school started at 8 o'clock in the morning, and my bus pickup time was about 7, but it was already like 6.40 or something, and I was still in my pajamas and hadn't even had breakfast yet. So my mom decided that today, we would just tell the bus driver to go on ahead and she would take me to school, which would give me plenty of time to get ready. So I'm sitting there at the dining room table, eating breakfast, still in my pajamas, and it's now about 6.50. We hear the bus pull up about 10 minutes earlier than usual. My mom peeks her head out of the door into the foggy morning and waves the bus on. She closes the door and comes back inside, but the bus doesn't pull away. There's a knock at the door and my mom opens it to find a man in a bus driver uniform. He explains that he's a substitute driver because the regular driver called in sick. He says he knows he's a few minutes early since he wanted to get an early start on the route because he didn't know it well. My mom explains to him that she was going to take me to school since we had woken up late. He gets visibly upset and says that he can wait a few minutes since he's already running ahead of schedule. My mom firmly insists that no, I will not be ready to go in a few minutes and tells him to go on ahead. He seemed angry about this, but turned around and got back on the bus and left. I returned to eating my breakfast, and at this point I still don't have my school clothes on, just my pajamas. But at 7 a.m. sharp, another bus pulls up to my house. My mom thinks this is really weird, so she goes outside to talk to them. She comes back inside looking terrified, doesn't really say anything about it and just tells me to finish getting ready for school and disappears into another room. At the time, I didn't really know what happened, but a few years later, my mom ended up telling me the story. When she went out to the second bus, she found that it was being driven by my regular bus driver and it was full of all the other kids that are usually on the route. The other bus was empty, by the way. Mom asks the bus driver about the substitute driver and about him calling in sick. The bus driver looks a little scared and says, I never called in sick. There is no substitute driver on my route. The driver immediately called dispatch in a panic and told my mom to go inside and call the police, which is what she did without me knowing. I'm assuming that's what she did in the other room and to report this incident. There was absolutely nobody doing my driver's route that day, except him. Whoever this was, he was most likely a kidnapper, the first bus guy, who had targeted me specifically 
because to the best of my knowledge, it seems that nobody else met with him. No one had him at their door, just me. I never heard anything about it again. Like I said, not even if somebody else had ended up being picked up by this mysterious fake bus driver. But chances are, had I gotten on that bus, I wouldn't have made it to school or back home. And if my mom hadn't overslept on that very specific day, I would have, without question, gotten on that bus. Saved by a lie in Baltimore by a now deleted user, posted to r slash let's not meet. When I was 19, in the early 90s, my brother and his wife were newly married and living in Baltimore, Maryland. I was from Maryland, but had yet to spend time in that city. I knew it wasn't totally safe in parts, but I also knew I was going straight to my brother and sister-in-law's house, so I would be fine. And I was, until, I turned onto the wrong street. This was MLK Boulevard, and back then it was a stretch of abandoned gas stations, sketchy bars, boarded up houses. A few people were walking in the street drinking out of paper bags, or bottles in paper bags. I knew that I had messed up, and instead of freaking out and getting more lost, I decided to pull into an abandoned gas station. There was a bank of payphones, and I parked about 10 feet away from them, hopped out, and called my brother. He was initially impatient, because he knew the city well, but it was my first time driving in it, and I was trying to write down his directions as he gave them to me. Just then, something caught my eye, and I looked over at my car. Three men were leaning against it. Two were on the passenger side, and one was against the driver's side of the front door. They were all staring at me with their arms crossed. I started to cry silently, thankful that I had sunglasses on. My brother heard me sniffling and said, Why are you upset? I'm giving you directions. But I couldn't tell him what was happening, as the men were within earshot. I got the rest of the directions, put them in my pocket, and walked to my car. The man leaning against my door reached up and actually wiped the tears off of one of my cheeks. And then he said, Why are you crying, baby? Nothing bad has happened. Yet. Without even thinking about it, I responded, fully sobbing now. I just shot my boyfriend. I'm in a lot of trouble. The cops are... That's all I got out. The three men had all taken off in separate directions at full sprints away from me. To this day, I have no idea where that lie came from, but if I hadn't been gifted with that lie from my guardian angels or whoever saved my butt that day, who knows what would have happened. She came through my ceiling, by a now deleted user, posted to r slash let's not meet. This just happened a few days ago, and I'm highly shaken. Some backstory. I live on the second floor of a three level apartment. We have a crawl space that connects all the apartments. We aren't sure why it's there, but we all have stuff in it. And none of us would ever even attempt to go inside so we still felt pretty safe. The other night, the sun was setting, but it wasn't pitch black out yet. I'm walking through my living room when I see a short woman on my fire escape looking into my windows. This is exceptionally bizarre, considering that it's still semi-light out and she had to get onto our fire escape somehow. We have two windows that the fire escape reaches and she was looking into both, but didn't see me. I crawled onto the ground, and my heart was racing, 
as I watched her try to open the windows. I didn't know what the heck to do, because my phone was in the other room. After what seemed like an eternity, she finally left. I went into my room to get my phone, to text my landlord and call the cops. I came back into the living room, and I looked out the windows to see if I could locate her, when suddenly I heard a weird noise coming from the ceiling. We have one of those tile ceilings made out of separate slabs of cork and wood. I looked up to see one of the slabs lifted and two eyes staring at me. I have no clue how she got into that crawl space so quickly, but I grabbed the nearest thing next to me, which was a broom, and I started hitting her with it through the ceiling. I called the cops as soon as she crawled away. They showed up and searched the place, but didn't find her, until a few days later, when she was on someone else's fire escape. The cops said she was definitely on some hard substances, and that she was even violent toward them. I'm glad she's gone, but I doubt I'll ever forget this anytime soon. I grew up in Monroe, Washington, about 45 minutes northeast of Seattle. Small, quiet town, with mostly woods and forests around it. I grew up and my mom and cousins used to always tell me a story about a man they called the Grocery Bag Man. The name is exactly what it sounds like. A creepy man in a trench coat, always carrying around one bag in each hand. This wouldn't be scary except for the fact that all of our houses were spread pretty deep in the backwoods, miles from downtown, where you would get groceries. Every single one of my family members would see him around their respective homes, usually early in the mornings. I never believed in this guy. I thought it was a joke. When I turned 16 and I could drive, I would always spend time with friends in and around the backwoods of Monroe. One night, I was driving to my friend's house who lives about 10 miles out of town, in a deeply secluded area. It's hilly, there are no sidewalks, and you never see people out. In order to get to this house, you had to drive into town from my house, and then back up another back road. As I drove down around 11 o'clock at night, I finally see Grocery Bag Man. One bag in each hand, trench coat long and creepy, disheveled hair. When I passed him, I swear he stared straight into my soul. I speed to my buddy's house for a little party, and I'm telling my friends about what I saw and the story that my family used to tell me. Of course, I'm being made fun of because nobody believes me. I eventually say, screw it, and stop trying to prove to them that there's this creepy dude haunting the old roads. At about two o'clock in the morning, we decide to drive into town to get some jack-in-the-box food, as high school boys tend to do. We all pile into my buddy's truck and start driving out of his neighborhood development. As we hit the stop sign to turn onto the main roads, I kid you not, Grocery Bag Man slowly walks past our car and continues down into the abyss. Needless to say, they weren't making fun of me anymore. You dropped your wallet by a now deleted user posted to r slash let's not meet. A little backstory. When I was 19, I lived with my mom in a ranch style house on a road that backed up to a large field. On the other side was the main highway. About half a mile down from me was a loony farmer and about a mile on the other side of me was, well, pretty much a crack house. I guess someone used to live there, but now it was really run down. I will say that usually the 
crackheads, I guess, were pretty quiet. Other than those two houses, we were pretty isolated. At the time, I was working full-time and going to school full-time. One of my classes ended at 10.30 at night. I often wouldn't get home that day of the week until about 11.15. I was driving home one night when I noticed a guy walking down the road. He had a yellow shirt and track pants. I remember his outfit because it was so stupid. It wasn't weird to see people walking down my road because of the whole crack house thing, but I instinctively looked over at him when I drove past. He turned and smiled and waved in this really weird way that freaked me out. It wasn't just that he smiled and waved, it was that it was totally not normal. I could tell he was on something. So I sped the half mile home and pulled into the driveway, a little bit weirded out still. I ensured all the doors and windows were secure, and then I just sat on the couch to be a paranoid freak, I guess, and I waited to make sure the dude walked past my house. Except he didn't. And there was another guy with him, dressed in darker clothes, which is probably why I didn't see him before. They walked up my driveway and started playing around with my car, testing the handles. In my hurry, I had forgotten to grab my phone from the car, so I was a little worried that's what they were after. Until the guy in the yellow started approaching my front door. I'm freaking out, so I go and wake up my mom. She's bleary and I'm trying to explain the situation. When we both hear the doorknob turn, very slowly. Good thing it was dead bolted. She got out of bed, walked to the door, and then Yellow Shirt knocked. I perched up on the couch to look at him and his friend, still in the driveway. The porch light was on because of the sensor. My mom said, Yeah, what do you want? You dropped your wallet, he said. I told my mom that I had my wallet. It was in my purse. So she calmly told him that she had her wallet and I did too, and it was too late to go around knocking on other people's doors. I remember perfectly what he said next, even though this was about six years ago as I'm writing this. He goes, Okay, I'm not a bad guy, just so you know. We were all pretty still. Nobody moved, not even the guy at the door. Not even when the porch light went off. Then he tried the handle again. My mom told me to call the cop so that she could get the gun, and I told her I didn't have my phone, so she walked to the kitchen to grab hers off the charger. She handed me the phone and walked to the bathroom. As she was going, she stared out the window into the backyard, which at the time I thought was odd. Then she went to her room to grab her Ruger. I was talking to the cops and explaining the situation, all while watching the two guys, explaining that there were two suspicious guys at our door. And that's when my mom came back out and said, and one in the backyard too, which explained why she had been looking out the bathroom window into the backyard. She had glimpsed him from the kitchen. She went to get a more discreet look. My mom walked back over to the door with her gun and loudly said, if he tries that handle again, I'm just gonna open the door and shoot him. I don't know why she said that instead of just waiting for the cops to arrive, but the guys took off down the road. I told her and she rushed to the bathroom where the guy who had been in the backyard saw his friends running down the road and sprinted off too. They were all going in the direction of that crack house. The cops searched our house and our yard and went to the drug house where they found five dudes hanging around. One was Yellow Shirt. I assume his friends were with him. They did get arrested and nothing weird like that ever happened again. But I was on edge for quite a while. I still ensure that the doors are locked at all times every day, even though I live in a much nicer area now.